You've been a performer and a musician pretty much all, all of your life, mm -hmm. but the songwriting career came later on. Were you writing songs before? Uh, yeah, I did write the odd thing. You know, I mean, in one of the bands I was in before Genesis, I wrote a couple of songs, very, you know, not very good songs, but um, and there was a piano in the house, so I used to play, you know, play one, miss one, play one, miss one, you know, um, and that's what kind of started me off in that direction at all because I was a drummer since the age of five, but, um, and I contributed bits to Genesis, but never really complete songs, you know, which was, my strength was in the playing side of it. So you contribute musical parts, but yeah. not the Yeah, and the, nothing, nothing, in, uh, Duke was the first time in 80, it was just, I'd written Face Value, but it was yet to come out, um, and I played the guys the songs that I'd written, and they chose a couple that they liked. And that was the first time anything of mine on my own had been out on a, you know, certainly on a Genesis record. Okay, but going, going back a bit before then, it was 75, I think, when, when Peter Gabriel left. You find yourself centre stage. Yes, well, Did I didn't want to. I didn't it came as a surprise? Yeah, well, I, it's kind of, it's weird, sort of, it's like being adrift in a boat, you know, and you fall asleep and you wake up and you think, how did I get here? You know, because it wasn't what I intended at all. In fact, when Peter said he was leaving, my initial reaction was, well, that's good. Well, it's forget about the singing. We'll just have an instrumental band, you know. I mean, this because that suddenly you can hear all the music because <laughs> there's no there's no singer, you know. Um, which of course didn't go down very well, uh, being a songwriting band. So we started writing the material and auditioning singers, and I was always got, I always got the job to sing to the people that were auditioning because I had been singing when Peter was in the band, um, and we never found anybody that we wanted in the family. So. We went into the studio without a singer. We had one guy that we thought might make it, and he, we did all the tracks. We had no concern for keys, about what he could sing or not. It's just, this is the way we wrote it, and he had to fit in with it. Uh, and uh, it didn't sound very good at all, the song he, he, he tried. So when he left, I said, you know, can I have a go? And so I went down and, you know, everybody's, so well, that sounded right. Let's, let's keep going with that one. And then the next day we tried another one and, until we f finished the album. And we still didn't have a singer, as far as I was concerned, because I just wanted to play the drums, you know. Um, so we had another sort of brief look for a singer, half-hearted attempt. And then it was talked about, why don't you do it? Which was like, it was the, you know, it was like a horror for me. I, you mean come out from behind the drums? I don't, this is not possible. I've been playing drums since I was five years old. You know, I mean, I, 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 I. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I started to come around to the idea this is the only way we're going to be able to do it. And I got to a friend of mine, Bill Bruford, to come and play drums for a year. And it was terrifying. So I they pushed you forward. A little forward. bit more terrifying than this, but just about the same. About the same. <laughs> so it wasn't an ambition at all then? No, at you all. To be a singer, to, to front the band, to... No, 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 no. And a lot of people, you know, it's a better story if, if the greedy drummer wants to be the singer and kicks the singer out. Yeah, it's a better story than the real one. But um, no, I, I sang in my school bands from behind the drums and I could do that now. And in fact, I did on the last Genesis to sing Follow You, Follow Me from behind the drums. It's not physically a problem. It's just that it looks terrible. You know, people can't see you. Know, so because you've got all this paraphernalia between you and the audience. So it was the last thing I wanted to do. It was like someone taking a security blanket away and all I have is a microphone stand, you know. And for years, I couldn't even take the microphone off the microphone stand. It was just like, it became this thing that I could hide behind. <laughs> was there a catalyst that actually yes. made you sit down and write songs yourself? Yes, the divorce, really. That always does it. Um, yeah, it was um, 77, 78. And I found myself in the house and, you know, Long story short, my wife had gone, my two children had, 
had gone, the, the two dogs had gone. So I had, you know, I had nothing to do. So I started to just fool around on the piano, just sort of just making demos. A couple of people heard them. Armit Ertigan was one. Tony Smith, who's been managing us for years, was another one. Said, "This is a record. You should put this out as a record." I said, "Well, I can't face. I can't face going back and re-recording everything. I've done it only just once, you know." So we had the idea. I just worked with Peter Gabriel on his third album, and I really hit it off with the engineer Hugh Pageant. And we had to listen to the demos and said, "Well, why don't we just use the demos?" So we took my one-inch eight-track demos because they were pretty, you know, high-quality tape. Took them into the townhouse in London, copied them to, to then was 16 track, and carried on working on the demos. So the demos became uh, the album. And you know, when you listen to the, if you were to sort of put a track up, you can hear the phone ringing, you can hear the fridge going on and off, and all this kind of thing. You know, it's 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 there, and I didn't know it was going to be used, so I didn't bother to do it again. I mean, a song like In the Air Tonight, I never wrote any of those lyrics down. Those words came out spontaneously. If you, if, you didn't, if you hadn't been writing songs before, no one had taught you how to write a song. Yeah. How did you know how to form a beginning and a middle and an end and know where to put the verse and the chorus? And well, and that kind of thing, the arrangements. That, my strength in, inside the years I'd been with Genesis was playing, seeing how other people's material could be interpreted and arranging it. You know, so I was, I was good at that. Um, but I'd never, you know, I, I kind of, these things were my mental, my mental notebooks, my, my, my messages to the ex-wife, you know, oh, if she hears this, she'll understand how hurt I am, blah, 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 you know. And she did, and she wasn't. <laughs> she <laughs> she just didn't care. Not particularly, no. But they were very, very personal songs, which is why I didn't want to re-record them again, and why I ended up playing as much as possible myself. Being personal songs, they then became, then, became very, very well-known songs. Was that quite a hard thing to go through? Well, for me, no. I mean, I was quite surprised, you know, I mean, that, that anybody else was interested, frankly. I mean, I was still the singing drummer, you know. I mean, I'd been singing with Genesis for two years, but I was still a drummer. And, and if that hadn't happened in my personal life, I would, would never have dreamt of making a solo album. In, in that case, if this hadn't happened in your personal life, do you think it's quite possible that you wouldn't have actually become a songwriter at all? It's quite possible, yeah. I mean, it was a pivotal moment, you know, I mean, uh, which is always leads to the difficult question when someone says, so if you could do anything again, what would you do? How can I say, well, I would, wouldn't do anything different? Because that means that maybe I could have made that, tried harder, although it's hard to believe that I did. I could have tried harder. But, you know, make it work and blow, you know. So it's a difficult kind of question because that led to so much. It led to me standing on my own two feet a bit more, being able to contribute more to the band, um, being able to write things that actually touched people, which is why they went out and bought the record, I guess. In the Air Tonight, is, uh, you, the lyrics, you said, just came to you. Yeah. So they weren't, you weren't writing about specific events? No. But, you know, I don't know if you've ever been divorced, but <laughs> there's a whole area of um, emotion that, uh, you know, I mean, in that song, you can hear, there's, there's some mystery, of course, but uh, that's more the sound and the way it's presented. It? But there's a lot of anger and there's bitterness and, uh, you know, but right next door to it on the album is a song called You Know What I Mean, which is like, hey, you've taken everything. You know I mean? So it's like it wasn't just anger on the album. But um, in fact, I tried to find, the interesting thing is I tried to find, the, I had the original lyrics, uh, at home in, in my pile of stuff. And I noticed that they were written, when I found them by accident, they were written on the back of the decorator's note paper, <laughs> who went off into what? So oh, right. I had this piece of sort of little, little piece, little piece of history here, and I tried to find it to bring it, you know, to show you, because it's like I, what I did, I sang the words, and then after the, I sang the words, I then wrote them down, you know, because they had to be written down at some point. But the lyrics all came spontaneously, and that... So I started like that. So my method of songwriting is, 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 is like that, you know. I, I very, very rarely do I sit down and say, now, I've got the tune, what am I going to write about? It's usually something, it could be a chorus, could be a verse, 
could be a couple of lines of, of something you've read, an idea, you know. And it starts off with a feeling or an emotion. Yeah. yeah. Is it cathartic? I think if you're miserable, you tend not to put on a happy record to make yourself feel happier. You tend to sort of put a sad song on so you can feel worse and really enjoy the moment, you know. And um, so I suppose there's this perverse enjoyment you get out of really seeing how how much you can say with as little as possible. I was really writing messages, you know, writing, writing little letters, musical letters, to my partner. So, yeah, and at this point you didn't really have an idea of them becoming public property? No. No. And it didn't embarrass me, actually. Some people say, aren't you embarrassed by this? I mean, uh, I never got embarrassed by what I wrote, because it was the truth, you know. You can only be embarrassed by lies, I think. In the air tonight, would you mind playing it? I know this one. <laughs> new material would you say so you um, you're there's something else you can find yourself adapting <laughs> I love the song I love it and that uh, as well you know just 
to write you know, some songs. I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm at you. So, um, so, so they suggested a couple of people, and one of them was Lamont Dozier, who was part of the Holland Dozier and Holland Motown team. Because I'd met him, and we'd kind of got on very well. He came to Acapulco where we were filming and he brought with him a demo of this song. And it was just, oh, it was just fantastic. And so I wrote the words in an afternoon and played it to him because I had it in a cassette recorder in the hotel room. I played it to him the next day. He said, well, you're going to have to sing it now. Now you've written it, you know. And that was two hearts, you know. And that was really, that was just trying to write Motown song. I mean, obviously I had half the team with, with me, but he was trying to write a song that was evocative of that, you know, da 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 heat wave, you see, it comes on and you just smile. Well, once you got started, you know, because you're saying you, d you, didn't, you didn't write songs that much until the divorce, yeah. but then you seem to be on, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but then you seem to be on something, something of a roll. Um, did it come easily after that? Yes. I mean, I, it's awkward. It's, I don't find it awkward to talk about. I just find it awkward to say, he's still on about a bloody divorce. But it's basically, it, it's reason why we're sitting here, you know. And by the time you get to the second record, well, the, the, by the time I got to my second record, it had gone past the hurt stage. It was now at the kind of, the, uh, the anger at receiving letters from lawyers and saying, what the f*** is this? By the time you were in a relationship again, presumably, happier than uh, <laughs> when, when, when it all went wrong in the first place. Did, were you still finding it easy to write? There was a point around that time where I was thinking, when you hear, like, even the names of the bands, the, the, the Four Tops, the, the, uh, the Marvelettes, the, the Miracles, you know, the Supremes, it's all very optimistic, you know? And I wonder why it is, and their, their songs were uplifting, you know? I love you, baby, but I'm gonna get you back, you know? Reach out, I'll be there, you know, Bernadette, don't go, you know? And um, I was wondering why I, I wasn't able to do that. And uh, you know, I'm still wondering sometimes. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I think the miserable songs are probably easier to write. Yeah. And nowadays, if I, write, if I start going down a ballad avenue, I'll think, oh, no, 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 I've done that. I have done that. I want to do something else that I've not done. So I, you know, I've probably thrown away quite a few good things just because out of bloody mindedness. Really. Just because I've got enough of them in the songbook. Yes. And they've heard enough of that. Against All Odds, <laughs> that, was, that was written for a commission or was, it a, was the song written before? Well, it was written at the same time as Face Value. Um, but I didn't consider it good enough to go on that album. So it lay there for a couple of years. I was on tour and Taylor Hackford, who, who directed the movie, got hold of me and said, I'd like you to write a song for this movie I'm doing. I said, well, I guess I'm on the road for the, you know, three or four or five months and um, I can't write on the road because I haven't got my stuff, you know. And he said, oh, it's a shame. Well, I said, I, said I, do have a, I do have a song, actually. I do have a song which I haven't done anything with. So I sent him the tape of the song and he said, oh, this is great. I love this. Did you have the lyrics already? Had the... I had some lyrics. I mean, I had to change them. You know, I had to modify. Some of the lyrics were, were, were already there, but, uh, but um, a lot of them... Well, well, obviously he wanted me to, you know, it's a song that cap, you know, kind of captures the mood of the film and what's been happening in the film. And she's Rachel Ward is just standing there with this guy who's just walked off. She's still very much in love with him. And um, so I wrote the lyrics. So does that then become a very different <clears throat> way of writing lyrics? It, it almost, you know, if, you, if you're writing for a story that already exists, does it become, not exactly acting, but, but you know, yeah, it, it, less, it, less emotional? Well, it's a bit like... Uh, if you go bowling and they put the barriers up, you know, for kids, so the ball just stays in, it's a bit like that, you know. You know that somewhere along the line you're gonna hit something because you've been given these lines to work bit between, so. And obviously you don't have that if you're writing on your own. So, I mean, and Taylor was, I kept singing, and you coming back to me is against the odds. And he'd say, all odds, against all odds. It's the name of the film, against all odds. I said, and it didn't roll off my tongue at all, you know. You coming back to me is against all odds. But I had to do it because it was, you know, he wanted me to do it for the film. How often have you performed against all odds? Oh, well, I sang it thousands of times. Um, but played it, I played it when I wrote it. <laughs> and then I played it at Live Aid twice in one day. But apart from that, I've never played it. Is it a tough song to play? 
Yes, uh, I, I would call it my troublemaker song because uh, I don't even know how I wrote it because it's not the kind of, I mean, it's not this, you know, play one, miss one, play one, miss one thing. It had all this movement in it, that, uh, which is one of the reasons why I, I kind of started to get a block against it. So why is it so tough to play? I don't know, because I opened the book, this book, uh, which I had to drag out of the, uh, the cupboard to find out what the chords were. And actually, the way that he's written, whoever did it, is, is you know, written the chords, so I can play it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm better now than I was, but... You know, uh, but the way I wrote it was kind of... It was my big ballad, you know, and I, that's what I can't do anymore. And I couldn't do then, so... Well, can we hear it in, uh, in, in some form, the way you in can play form. it now? <laughs> yes, yeah, so it'll be... <clears throat> I'll be treading very carefully around it, just so you know. Also, I can't play the best bits, which is the beginning and the end, which are reef wrote. So... Is there a formula to writing a hit single? Probably. I mean... Have you got well, one? No, 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 no. The fact that people like what I do is, is like a happy coincidence because I would, you know, I'd just do what I do and people either like it or they don't. And, uh, but for a while there, because there's no... They, they couldn't, people couldn't quite understand it. Critics couldn't quite understand it. I was supposed to be, you know, the King Midas with the formula that knows exactly what's going on. I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, there are obviously, I guess you get, and they would admit it, the Stock Aiken Waterman kind of writers in the, those in the 80s, I guess it was now. But, um, you know, then there's a formula, formula for that. You know what's going to happen, you know, and, and it, it pushes all the buttons, you know, and that kind of thing. You must get to get a stage when, uh, and I imagine it's quite a scary stage, when, when it's time to play the song to somebody else and see what they think, mm. and their reaction 
that must affect the way you feel. <laughs> do you have a, are you ritualistic about that? Or do you have, is there someone in particular you ask to hear it first or how does that work? I don't really believe anybody. I believe me, I think. I mean, obviously this is a terrible different way of working, terribly different way of working if you're working with Disney. For example, I, uh, you know, I'll write a song thousands of miles away to a piece of film if I'm lucky. Some of the time it's just a few lines on a page of what the action would be. So I'll write the song and then you've got three directors, well, two directors and a producer, plus all the people in the background that are all there, you know, executive producers and executive directors and whatever. And you, you're playing this thing and then there's this awful silence at the end where... And you, I mean, I've, I, I've lived, I grew up in the world where this is what I do, this is, this is, this is my album. Do what you want with it. Uh, as opposed to record companies saying, oh, we, it's not finished yet, we need a couple of other songs on it, it's a bit dark, isn't it, and whatever. You know, I, I, I was brought up in the other world. And um, so to have suddenly a committee tell you what's right or wrong with it, you know, that's a bit, you have to, you have to just take that hat off and put a different hat on. And I love that, I love that hat, you know, because I'm, I'm learning to do something brand new that I've never done before, working with this kind of team whether it be the musical Broadway people or whether it be the, the film people. Um, but I don't really, there's no one I can really say, because by the time people hear it, I've, I've already decided that it's good enough or it's not good enough. Do you have writer's block? I go to the periods when I don't really write at all. Um, and frankly, if I sit in my, and I've got a little studio in my house, and I, I will sit and I'll write and I'll, I may hoping that something's going to happen, record it. And if it doesn't, then I just get rid of it. But um, I can just walk away from it, you know, if, if nothing's happening. You walk out, come back a half an hour later, and the first thing happens, oh, wow, that's good. What was that? I don't have to hammer away at it because I've got a deadline to meet. You know, if it's not happening, it's not happening. But would you feel uh, something of a loss if you didn't write? Yes. I mean, Keep I, writing songs? I, yeah. I'm at the stage now in my life that... The writing is the most pleasurable thing. It's the satisfaction of writing it and doing it and make, you know, now with computer you can just go on forever or, or not, but you can actually, you know, change things. Sometimes you have a mistake, you shift the whole part to a different, you copy the part and it all goes to a different instrument and suddenly it's like, what was that? Was a, you know, happy accidents like that. But the, that's what I get the most pleasure from. So I can see a time in the very, very near future where I will write songs and nobody else will hear them but me. Another Day in Paradise, we, I'm going to ask you to play it in a minute, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, before we get there, can, can you ask... I do you like music. I'm sure you do. I'm sure I, just, I, I'm not very I good hope you it. like playing so, it as well. Uh, <laughs> what was the, what was the uh, circumstances behind writing that and the inspiration for that song? Well, this actually was one of those moments where I, there was nothing happening. It was a, a, what you call a block, but... And I did leave the room, and I did come back, and the first thing I wrote was, uh, if I can get it right, but... Which is quite a lot in some of my stuff, actually. But, but anyway, I, I wrote that, and I thought, okay. I managed to tap the idea a little bit back to playing in America with Genesis, and we were going, we were playing in Washington. And I remember we had a pastor that was driving us. He was a, you know, part-time limo driver as well. But he, he was in this van, and and, um, and I said to him, because uh, it was snowing, and there was all these people out on the streets, you know. And I said, what's what's going on here? Is there a sort of demonstration or something? He said, no, no, this is where these people live. I said, and you could see Capitol Center, you know, for me. And I said, you're joking. What? Washington, you know, I thought was one of the wealthiest cities in America. And it is, but then there's this huge gap. But uh, he said, no, they live here. This is their home, this, these boxes. I said, my God. And I think it must have just subliminally gone in. The song now is, is so associated with the homeless um, and it almost seems wrong to burst the bubble, but but when I wrote I wrote the song and did it in some kind of you know like come some kind of order onto tape, sounding like I could sing along to it. I'm afraid that's what came out. You know, uh, there was no burning 
issue to help solve the world's homeless problem. So these songs take on their own entity and then, oh, yeah. and then you find yourself being criticised by Alexis Sale for, for um, what he perceived as, I don't know, maybe he felt that you're not in a position to write about this. So does it then feel that you own this song or does it feel that uh, you're, you're separate from that criticism or...? How well, no, I just feel? think that, the, I mean, from the criticism point of view, it's just that he hasn't listened to it. It's just, it's just, to him, it's just an annoying song. He hasn't actually listened to the, what the words are. You know, the idea is that we should just all thank God that we're as lucky as we are. You know, you, me, him over there who's not living in a box. You know, but the criticism was like that, uh, how would I know because I am, got, I'm wealthy? Well, there you, you, people, you, you imagine what it's like. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, I'll play it. Shut up. Calls out to the man on the street, Sir, can you help me? It's cold and I know where to sleep. There's some way you can tell me. He walks on, he doesn't look back. He pretends he can't hear. Starts to whistle as he crosses the street. Seems embarrassed to be there. Ooh, think twice. It's another day for you and me in paradise. Oh, just think twice. It's just another day for you. You and me. I was wondering what your process is to, for the very beginning of a song, whether it would start with a melody or a bunch of chords. I used to be more reliant on um, keyboards rather than piano because their sounds had atmosphere and they would, when you play something, it would make you want to play this next. You know, like, and so I, st I used to play around with that an awful lot. So almost like the feeling of the music rather than the notes themselves yeah. would create the song. Yeah, and then, you know, but then at the same time, without any of that, you just start playing on piano and you get a different kind of song, you know. So, um, it's all, all the different kind of the tools you got all make it different, you know. Why do you think you still write songs if, you, if you've, uh, presumably you've got over the divorce now? <laughs> that was a while ago. Three, mate. Three. <laughs> they they keep to... coming. Is that, what, what, what do you think spurs you on to keep on writing? I want to see if you can do it again a bit better, you know. I mean, it's like, I'm always more interested in the thing that I'm going to write than the thing I did write. You know? Okay. And what's that like, hearing, hearing your old songs? Does it feel like looking at old photographs of yourself or...? Yeah, well, my, my six-year-old, he wants to, you know, he's particularly... Um, 
he'll listen to a song like No Son of Mine from Genesis, or he'll listen to a song like Driving the Last Spike, which is about <laughs> about the making of the English railroads, you know, Genesis song. And he'll say, what, what does that mean? What, what is that? What, why did you say that? I said, well, I just said it because it popped out of my mouth. Or why do you go, ha, 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 mama? Why do you do that? Because the rest of the song is not like that. It's <laughs> kind of hard questions to answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I sort of say, well, yeah. I, at, you know, at the time, that's what I did, and everybody seemed to like it, so we did it. <laughs> but it's <laughs> great question. I guess also what you're saying is that there isn't necessarily a, a clear logic to, uh, to why you went, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Well, there's, uh, there is a, there's a completely clear logic to the story, but I mean, uh, it's difficult to explain that that's why you did it, as opposed to just everyone laughing and then you getting on and not doing it, you know. You know in fact, our, our, our engineer at the time brought in Grandmaster Flash, the message, while we were recording, while we were writing Mama. And he, he put it on. And this is like early days of rap, you know. I mean, you listen to it now and it's like very, very different from the stuff you hear now. But it's like a, you know, it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. <laughs> and we laughed. We thought, what a fantastic thing to put in a song. Just a laugh. <laughs> so I went out there and we were writing and, um, and we would get to this bit, like the drum machine was going and it was like just hoody chords. And I went, <laughs> and they all looked around and I said, that's good, I like that. Yeah. So eventually it became part of the song. So the message inspired Mama in, yes. inadvertently. Yes, and you tell people that and they'll think I'm crazy, you think you're crazy. You know? Well, life I takes think... unexpected turns. I, mean, I imagine when you started you didn't think you'd be a, you know, a player on the hip-hop scene. Hip-hop, I remember seeing a program uh, just flipping through the channel one day and Ice-T, I think it was, back in the early days of, of uh, rap. He was, uh, there was a documentary about him and they were in his living room and he said, oh, yeah, and this, this cynical journalist said, well, what have you got in your record collection then? And he found my albums. And he said, what the, what is Phil Collins doing in your record collection? He said, hey, man, don't mess with my film, man. <laughs> and I thought, my God, this is, this is nice, you know, because you get so used to what you read about yourself that actually hearing it from, from a musician, in, in music, there is none of that. Yeah, it's more open-minded. Yeah, it's just music, good or bad, you know. Does it feel strange when you, uh, when you realise that these songs have become such public property? I mean, these songs are so well known. You know, something, well, you could take in the air tonight. You know, you might be driving down a road in Georgia or somewhere and it can mm. come on the radio. It's no longer, in a way, it's no longer yours. I, I, I automatically assume, I mean, I, I just can't get myself into the other way of thinking about it. But I automatically, when I leave the country, they stop playing the records. You know, you go to America and you promote something and they play, play yeah, there's a see if you're right. Put it away till it comes back, you know, and then someone will say, oh, I was listening to, I was in the car today, There's someone in America and I'm here. Say, oh, I heard you, I went, two stations were playing two of your things back to back. It was extraordinary. And I thought, really? You mean life goes on when you're not there? We talked a little bit about the Tarzan Commission with the song. Yeah. Can you just tell me a bit about how that came about? I got a phone call saying, would I like to do the music? write the music for a Disney movie. Now, I mean, uh, you kind of, you got to understand that, that Disney, my brother, my older brother is a, is a cartoonist and the animators were his heroes. My sister is an, was an ice skater and she skated in Wembley every year. We had Dopey living with us, you know. We had little Kenny Baker living at my house. Uh, he was playing Dopey and Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. A dog didn't know what to make of him at all. But, but he was living at our house. So Disney for me, is like something that I've... I was riding the bike and my dad let go of the saddle when he was singing, hey, diddle diddy, and actors, you know, I've got a lot of mm. history with it. It's there from the start. So um, when they asked me to write a m music for a movie, I thought, God, this is, you know, I'm suddenly being asked to become a member of a club that I never thought I'd be a member of. So I said, no, originally. I said, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm not good enough for that. And I spoke to the music guy, the guy that puts people with the movies, and he said, y y listen, I, you can do it. I said, I, I can't write. I can't be like Alan Menken. I can't do those comedy songs. You know, be my guest, be my guest. I can't do that. He said, well, we don't want you to do that. Otherwise, we'd get Alan Menken to do it. What we want you to do is be you, but write it to the movie. So suddenly, I saw things from a different perspective. You know, they, when you do the something like a Disney movie, they, they'll give you a, a, a three or four maybe pages of, of an outline of a story. And they say, we may want a song there. Probably a song there, a song there, the baby's crying, yes, we're going to want a song there for the ape to sing. 
You think, I'm going to write a song for an ape to sing, right? So, OK, I don't do that often. So I sent them the demos of the songs, and the director started to fall in love with the demos. And uh, it was then suggested that I would sing in the movie. And I said, you're crazy. You know, people have gone to go and see the movies expecting the ape to sing, you know? You can't suddenly have Phil Collins' voice. It's going to take them back to somewhere else, you know? And in fact, we had a sort of 11th hour thing where Glenn Close, who did the voice for Carla, who is the mother ape, I had uh, I was sat in the, you know, in the studio with her to teach her it. And um, she was much more Broadway than pop. And she couldn't get the rhythm of the thing. And then we've, we'd, you know, it's, it's all upbeat. And there's, no, there's nothing on one. Come stop your crying, it will be a just take my hand. She couldn't handle that. So uh, I ended up singing it because of that, really. But anyway, I'll try to amble through this. Come stop your crying, it will be all right. Just take my hand. Lovely. Mm. And I even like the pauses. <laughs> thought they added it's something. There's some, I wrote the chords down. I mean, what is the point of writing the chords down if you can't look at them when you need to? But anyway. Does the inspiration keep coming? Well, I, I do like when, you know, these things are presented to me that are a little bit outside the box, you know, or my box, anyway. Um, you know, what I mean, Tarzan, we talked about when the film was out, we did talk about taking it on the stage because they were having great success with Lion King having transferred from the, the, the screen to the stage. 
And um, unfortunately, at the time, you know, they couldn't they couldn't work out how to do animals. You know, that wasn't like the Lion King, or it wasn't like gorillas with zips up the backs. You know, so um, it, nothing happened to it. But then they suddenly got a great designer and writer and director involved and uh, called me back and said, do you want to do the Broadway musical? And it was like, for me, I grew up, I was the Artful Dodger in Oliver in London, you know, and I, when I was 14. And, and so to actually write a musical, that was like, wow, to do what Lionel Bart did, you know. And I just totally got into it for four years, lived in New York for six months when it started. And um, I just found that it was like a completely different way of writing. And that was just fantastic to sort of be given that opportunity you know, whatever age I was, uh, 51, 52 then. Do you think you'll, you'll always write songs? Um, yes. Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's my hobby as well as my life, as well as my job, you know what I mean? So you still enjoy it? Oh, yeah, yeah. What I, you know, I say the part of it that... And even, you know, I mean, I, I just... Going back to the things with the, my young kids, you know, um, they, they're discovering what Dad does, you know, and... Um, the other night they wanted to watch something. They've heard the song, they wanted to watch the video. So I put on something and I was watching and you think, oh, you know, if I could, if I could do that, but still come home every night, I'd do it, you know? But it just drags you away from home and then suddenly, you know, you miss whole periods of, of your kids growing up. And I was, you know, the actual doing it, I, I love performing, but, uh, but I, one thing I will always do is, is write because that's, that's what I, that's what I do now. It's, it's part of what I, keeps me going. Thank you so much. That was great. I enjoyed it. This new series continues on Thursday nights at 8 from the 1st of May on Sky Arts and is also available in HD on Channel 268. Find out more about who's involved and what they get up to at skyarts.co.uk slash songbook.